Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. A warm welcome to Meet Menaka, episode 73. Today, we are going to talk about planning for inheritance tax with Yogesh Patmanathan, who is a chartered accountant. Before we go about the speaker a bit more, let me tell you what the talk show is about. Meet Menaka features real people sharing real stories and also experts in their own fields to come and add value and create social change, a positive change. It's a vibrant multicultural 90 minute online talk show to celebrate each and every one of you. You can join the event by registering. The link is almost every social media it's available. If not, please text us, send us a message or email us and we'll be happy to send you the link. Please join our community to add value, share inspirational messages and create a positive change by subscribing. YouTube channel where we normally share all our episodes. There is a library of episodes there already. It's called Beat Menaka. And if you want to be notified and benefit from the videos in the future, please hit the bell icon too. Coming back to the speaker today, we are going to be talking about planning for inheritance tax. We will come back why it is important. Before that, Yogesh Patmanathan, he's an experienced chartered accountant and a founding member of Sasan Co-Chartered Accountants. He's a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales and specializes in UK tax law. So this year, we have started with certain things about fraud prevention and inheritance tax because Early in the year is something we all talk about change and how we can put our life in order. And I think in that theme, we felt it will add value to add the inheritance tax because many of us work hard and save up or have little, a bit more asset uh, compared to others. Regardless where we are, I think this is an aspect we will have to look at. To be honest, even for me personally, I wasn't aware that how widely it applies to people till I spoke to Yogesh. So I am like all of you waiting to learn for, about inheritance tax as well. So a very warm welcome to you, Yogesh. Thank you, America. It's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be part of this audience and to share my knowledge. And hopefully uh, by the end of the session, that you will have a better understanding about. Uh, I call it IST, that stands for inheritance tax. Uh, I'll be continue to call IST to make it uh, make it shorter uh, as as a make it shorter. So, uh, so hopefully you will by the end of this session that you will have a better understanding and you'll be better aware of uh, what the situation of the estate values are, so that you can uh, seek and you can plan ahead. Uh, that's where I want to. Uh, that's the objective of this meeting. Thank you so much, Yogesh. So let's start by looking at your journey as to how you got to what you are doing at the moment and in particular about inheritance tax. Sure, so um, I'm, a bit like, uh, I'm a bit like you, Menaka. So I was born in Sri Lanka. Uh, I had a different journey than you. I grew up in New Zealand and uh, ended up in the UK in 1998. Uh, I was extremely lucky because uh, one of the chartered accountants firms in the UK offered me a training contract at the time. Uh, so I continued to do my exams. I was uh, part of the audit team with the chartered accountancy firm there. I qualified in audit and then I kind of thought, okay, what am I going to do after this? Uh, audit doesn't really, uh, it was interesting, but uh, didn't really challenge me on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I kind of, next step, for me was to get into tax and then I was working in various firms uh, specializing in UK tax and then uh, 2014 I thought I got enough knowledge now so it's time for me to do something on my own the circumstances and then the situation in my life kind of helped me to you know it was, that was the right time for me to set up my own firm so that's what I did in 2014 I set up my own firm uh, now it's called Sasson & Co uh, Chartered Accountants and uh, Though our firm specializes in accountancy, uh, in tax, I specialize in tax. We also do accountancy and tax generally, so that's what we do. 
before we go into it, Yogesh, you would like to have a poll? That'd be great. Yes, I was gonna say if you can, just uh, doesn't we don't know who you know we don't get to see who who the. Do you have an estate valued over three hundred and twenty-five k? It is applicable for people who are living in the UK. If yep. you don't mind, you know, if you're if you happy to share it now. So generally, it applies to people in the UK uh, who have estates over three hundred twenty-five thousand as it stands. Uh, if you want to show off hands, that'll be great to know the number of people who have got estates over 325,000. I can see one hand there. Uh, I can see a couple of hands, three or four hands there. Okay. Yeah, so that's good. Okay. I could see Robert putting his hand. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Why should our audience or my audience be interested in inheritance tax? Because a lot of people, including myself, sometimes yeah. assume that yeah. inheritance tax is only for the privileged or the wealthy. And why should everybody know about sure. this? Sure, you're right, Merika. So this is why, uh, you know, it's very crucial that you should be aware of IHT, especially if you're living in the UK, especially if you're li living in London. Um, easily your, your family home that you live, uh, live in could be easily over 325,000. And not a lot of people are aware of that this is lurking behind them until you know something happens to them, and then your your loved ones pick up the bill. So my my advice is it, it's the it's the privileged few who are aware of it. They do the planning with people like all the chartered accountants. You know, we do the planning for them so that the exposure is limited, or in some cases is completely eliminated. But even if you know the people who are not aware of the other ones who really get caught out. So you should be aware of it and you, know, you should never forget the fact that it is lurking behind you and uh, it, it can, you know, it, you need to plan for it. At least you need to be aware of it and then you've got to start actively start planning for it. Thanks, Yogesh. And I think it is something for all of us to take on board. We all have children, parents, uh, you know, grandchildren, and it's widely applicable. So I think it's important. Before anything else, I think Yogesh, you want to make a disclaimer really. Sure. Yeah. So let's look at before we go. In, I mean, I got two scenarios here, so that it's easier for me to explain. IHT is one of those things. It's not very complex. I mean, once once you understand the concept, then you can know what's going on. So if I, it's easier for me to put two scenarios here and then explain what, how it works out. So if you just go to the screen, if the screen before that, I start with the disclaimer. So. Uh, with all the firms, char chartered accountants, we start with the disclaimer. Uh, it is general advice that we're giving you here. Sorry, I beg your pardon, just general guidance that we are giving you here. It's not advice. So your individual circumstances could differ from person to person. So before you start acting on any of the guidance that I'm giving you here, you need to seek expert uh, expert financial advice, expert uh, accountancy advice, tax advice before you act on it. Okay, so if you're going to slide uh, scenario one, Menaka. So let's look at scenario one. Uh, so let's, I'm going to talk about these are all, you know, hypothetical cases that I've come up with names that are all made up. So let's assume we are talking about Mira, who is resident and domiciled in the UK. Uh, she was never married and wealthy in her own right. Now, let's assume that Mira died this morning. She was 64. She died on the 16th of January 2022. This morning she died. Um, I was also made an assumption that she made a lifetime gift of 250000 to her niece, Charlotte, to help her buy a flat in London on 1st of June 2020. So that's just under three years there. Okay. And at her death, her, now the assets are getting valued at probate. She, has, she owns the London Freehold property valued at 650000 uh, She also got cash in Lloyd's Bank of 200000 uh, she also got jewelry held valued at 50,000. Now her will states all the assets to goes to niece Charlotte. That's what the will says. So that's the direction of the will there. Okay. Now, if you look at the death estate, now she has got a freehold property sitting at 650,000. She got cash sitting at 200,000, jewelry sitting at 50K. If it's the total estate value, it works out to 900,000. Now, everyone in the UK, uh, because she was she was not married, she everyone in the UK gets three hundred twenty five thousand, what we call a nil rate ban. Okay, now that is the exempt amount for IHT. Now because she made a gift of two hundred fifty thousand uh, within seven years of death, 
uh, she's going to use a part of that nil rate band, and she can only use 75,000 of the nil rate band. Now, that leaves her with a taxable estate of 825,000, of which she has to be paid at 40, 40%, which works out to 330,000. Now, in the UK, IST has to be paid within has to be payable within six months uh, of death. So technically, she needs to pay. Uh, let's say today is January, she needs to pay January, February, March, April, July. By end of July, that forty that three hundred thirty thousand becomes payable. Okay, so that's how serious the situation is here. Um, let's look at another another scenario. America, if you go to yes, um, uh, before that, let me tell. If anyone wants to refer to this, please take a screenshot because uh, once these two examples are finished, I'm going to uh, you know stop sharing the slides. Uh, let's look at scenario number two. So I'm going to slightly make a change here. I do still Mira, but in this situation here, Mira is resident and domiciled in the UK. She was married. The case, the case scenario at, in scenario two, she was not married. In this scenario, she was married, and she's still wealthy in her own right. Now, let's assume you know, she was married to Vikas, who died in March 2013. Now, in his will, he left all the assets to his wife. He never made any gifts, any lifetime gifts, gifts seven years prior to his death. So, and Mira dies again to, you know, let's assume that Mira died this morning, age 64. And now she has got a child survived by her only child called daughter called uh, daughter called Akila. Okay. Now the other the, the situation, the scenario is very similar now to scenario one. She still made a gift to her niece, Charlotte, to help her buy a flat in the UK on 1st of June 2020. Again, it's within three years. Now the assets limit assets are still the value that value this valued at the same level. Now, slightly different will now. Her will states that all the assets go to her daughter, Akila. So that's the direction of the will now in this situation, right? Now, if you look at the, the death estate now, it's the total estate is still valued at 900,000. Now, because she was married and the husband, she was survived by her husband, she gets, gets to use her husband's nil rate band as well. So that's why you get 650,000 instead of the 325,000. Because she has made a lifetime gift, which is a potentially exempt transfer, we call it a pet, uh, for 250,000. She's left with 400,000 of the new rate ban. Now, slightly different here, you also, she also gets to claim something called the resident new rate ban. What that means, because she, she, lived, she owns a family home, and that is going to her lineal descendant, descendant, which Akira is a daughter. So she's a lineal descendant of her. She also gets, gets to use something called a resident in red bag of 175,000. Now, because her husband never used it up in, in, on, on his death, she gets to use times it by two, including his resident in red bag as well, which, work, which works out to 350,000. Now you will see the total taxable estate has come down to 150,000 and on, on which IHG is only payable of 60,000, which is really lower, uh, a lower value than what was the scenario one. Okay, so that's that's a gist of how IHG works in the UK. I mean, there are lots of other complex areas that will go, uh, you need to factor in, but that's the gist of generally what happens in the UK. And that's how the gist of how the numbers work. Thank you so much. I, ho I hope all of you took a screenshot if you want to refer back to it. I'm sure it's important for everyone, but I just want to move on to other things. Can I know, I asked you the question, why should our audience be interested in inherited tax? You have mm -hmm. partially kind of explained it, but can you tell us how would it affect them? You have given examples. You have mentioned nil rate band and resident nil rate band as yeah. well. And what is it? Because I think it's quite technical. Uh, even I personally, uh, of course, I'm not an accountant. I find it very technical. Uh, can you explain to them, please? Sure. So the, the starting position in the UK is, are you resident for UK tax purposes and domicile for UK tax purposes? So the domiciliary, domiciliary in the UK plays a major part for IHD, all right? So if you are just resident for UK tax purposes, and if you are not domiciled for UK tax purposes, 
on your death, only the UK assets will fall into your estate. Now, most of us are UK resident for tax purposes and domicile for tax purposes. What that means is bad news. What that means is not only the UK assets will fall into your estate, your overseas assets will fall into your estate as well. Now, this can easily take over that 500,000 or 325,000 limits that we're looking at. Now, with the new rate ban, uh, like what I saw, like what we saw in scenario one and scenario two, everyone in the UK, whether you are domiciled or you know your resident, domicile doesn't apply to your new, new rate ban, will get that 325k. Now, if you if you are survived or if you are if you if you are survived by your husband or wife, you will also get provided that he or she has used up her new rate band or his new rate band, you also get to accumulate their new rate band as well in your estate. Now, like what we saw in scenario two, if your family home falls into the estate and if it goes into a lineal descendant, what that means is it could be your child, it could be a stepdaughter, a stepchild, uh, you will also get that 175,000 to use against the estate or if it was, if you're married, uh, if, you're, if your husband or wife hasn't used it before and they are passed away, you get to use theirs as well. That's how it works. Thank you, Yogesh. The other one you mentioned is taper relief associated with AHT. What is taper relief and why should people know about it? Okay, so, so you can see on, 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 um, on scenario one and scenario two, uh, we are an ex uh, what Mira does is she makes a, a gift, a lifetime gift to Charlotte for 250000 Now, that is generally it's considered there are no other tax implications in the UK because it is cash that's passing hand. Now, it is considered a potentially exempt transfer. We call it PET. So what that, have, what that means is if you, you know, you can make a PET today, and if you survive for seven years, there are no IST implications to that matter, no tax implication, no other tax implications at all in the UK. Now, if you do die within seven years, that comes into play for IST. Now, if you die within, now in that situation there, Mira made that gift in 2020, so she dies within three years of making that gift. Now, let's say that she died four years or five years after making that gift. If any IST is due on it, it'll be tapered away at 20% per year uh, on, on the IST due. Let's say that you, you know, there's IST due on that becomes 80,000 and it's the fourth year that she dies. So let's say there's 20,000 worth of IST due on it. Okay. So she only, it gets tapered away and there's only 16,000 worth of IST that they, she needs to pay. That's why it's called taper release. So it gets tapered away after three years of making the pet 20% per year. Sure. Thank you, Yogesh. My mathematics is quite good, but even I am pleased to move on to um, non-mathematical questions <laughs> going forward. We sure. all hear, as I guess, as we are growing older, our parents are growing even older. We are thinking about and hearing about IHC so much more. For people who joined a bit later from other parts of the world, IHT means inheritance tax. Sure. So, you know, we have this common assumption um, yeah. that inheritance tax, we only have to start thinking about it at a certain age or certain stage of life. Sure. According to you as an expert, when do people have to start thinking about IHG, Yogesh? <clears throat> so generally, when you are young, you are healthy, uh, you don't, you know, people, uh, even if I'm, um, to say, to be honest, in my, in my 20s, I never started, you know, I wasn't thinking about IHT at all. Now, generally, my advice is you got to start thinking about IHT after the age of 45, even could be even earlier, if you're wealthy. But if you are, if, if you're in the, uh, you know, if you're middle class in the UK, you got to start thinking about IHT, you know, at, at the age of 45 latest. But if you are terminally ill, you know, you got to start, you know, if you think, you know, especially if you've got a family history of falling sick, you've got to start thinking about IHT well, well into your, you know, well, well in, in your early 30s, so it could be even early, earlier than that. It depends a lot on your, your, your financial, you know, your financial wealth, really. It, it depends, it, that will define how soon you got to start thinking about it, you know, and, and also your, 
you know, once you start having kids, uh, if you got grandparents, you know, you, you know, those are those are the triggers for for start thinking about IHT. Yes, it is interesting. You said it's uh, forty or forty-five. Uh, for, first of all, I think entrepreneurial world has changed a lot. Uh, you know, lot lot of younger people, uh, I think, uh, are making that mark sooner. And uh, also, people who have par- parents, they might not be aware. I think the earlier we get to know, I think we can educate our parents and grandparents. Do you think it's valid? Absolutely, I think. Like I, you know, like what I mentioned before, not a lot of people in the UK are aware of IHT. They're aware of IHT, but they still kind of ignore and they kind of put their head in the sand thinking this is not going to apply to me. But you'd be surprised the number of people who get caught out. Uh, like what I mentioned before, the, the smarter ones, they will get advice right along and they are mitigated and the exposure is very limited. It's the middle class who've been you know, putting their hand in the sand and they're gone. And when the kids pick up the bill, you know, they, the kids kind of grow up thinking there's gonna be an estate or there's money coming their way on the parents' death. And then they'll be, you know, they'll be, they'll be in for a shock to see that most of their money is gone in IHT. So it's better to plan than not to plan for IHT. And you got to be ex- extremely. And I, I agree because I think I have friends, and I think uh, it's a very difficult uh, subject to, um, I guess, start talking with your parents because Correct. you are indirectly um, aiming, saying that you might not be there. And but you know, mm-hmm. I also know people who have plans, you know, much much uh, younger. I still remember. I was only, I think, perhaps because of the political situation in Sri Lanka, I don't know what it was, but when I was in school uh, yeah. time, my father talking about these things and writing his will and all that uh, at a very, very young age. Yeah. So I think it is really important for all of us to start thinking and yeah. encourage um, yeah. your parents, grandparents to do the same. Absolutely. If I, if I can just add more one, you know, people, the other, th- other, other, the other reason people don't want to start looking at IHT is, you know, it is, it's death tax, you know, let's face it. And people don't want to talk about death. You know, parents, kids, no one wants to talk about death. But, but you just need to be aware of it. It is lurking behind all the time. It is there. You just can't ignore it. It is there. The way I see it is every moment you have is a gift. But the only thing is, uh, it, as they say, the two final things are tax and debt. So yes, definitely one thing um, is lurking around for sure. So I have heard there are lifetime exemptions. What are they and how would it help reduce uh, someone's estate, Yogesh? Sure. So we call it, uh, so there are lifetime exemptions in terms of anyone in the UK can give £3,000 worth of uh, 3k worth of money to anyone in the UK it you know it is a pet it is it is an it's a lifetime it's an annual exemption so every year um, I could give you Manica 3,000 pounds I don't mind uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll look for the check now <laughs> uh, you know it is not a pet it, they they you know it, it reduces my estate and that won't fall into my estate uh, there's also any number of gifts that you can make to any number of people 250 pounds every year so if you've got grandkids, you know, you've got others, you know, Christmas gifts, uh, 100 people, you can give up to 250,000. It'll be, it'll never be considered a pet in the UK. Uh, we also have, when you get married, um, I'm just looking at the tax textbooks here. So if you are, you know, wedding gifts, so if your daughter or if your son or daughter is getting married, you can give to a child uh, up to 5,000 pounds as a wedding present. Uh, wedding, you know, you can transfer cash that's not it, it is that's not that's not a, you know that's not a pet if you're a grandchild you can give up to two and a half, two and a half thousand that's not a pet and uh, any other marriages you can give up to thousand pounds that's not a pet uh, there are other ways that you can plan as well including setting up a trust but i think we'll come to that shortly i, I think you know, i will talk about trust and we'll, we'll talk about that shortly thanks Yogesh. yes so if someone wants for example if i want to gift uh, the family home to my daughter Mm-hmm. or son in, in someone else's case in lifetime uh, to reduce their estate on their debt. Are there any tax implications? Is, is it a good idea basically to do that? Now, 
you can, let's say that, you know, let's look at you as an example, Menika, if I may. So let's say that, you know, you got a family home and you want to give this uh, to your daughter in lifetime. Now, in terms of the taxes that you need got to bear in mind at that point, it's capital gains tax. And then of course, the IST. Now, because it's your, it's your family home that you are gifting it to your daughter, uh, there's no capital gains tax at play because it's capital gains tax at, 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 at play at that point. But what you need to remember is it is a gift that you have made to your daughter and it is a potentially exempt, exempt transfer. So if you die within seven years, that will come into play for IST. Uh, what you also have to remember is that some people in, you know, you, they think they, they get, think they're very smart. So what they do is they, uh, they give the house to a child and they move into that house. So they continue to live in that house. Now there are rules, anti-avoidance rules called gift with reservation of benefit. Uh, if you continue to derive a benefit from a gift that you have made, uh, the UK tax authorities will force you to fold that asset back into your estate. So you've got to be very careful if you do that, how the planning goes with you. Let me understand this uh, fully. So are you saying you're not allowed to live in that house once you give, give it as a gift to your children? You can continue. So let's say that you, 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 you give the house to your daughter. Yeah. Uh, technically, you would still have to take share of the bills that goes with the house, or you need to pay rent to your daughter for the portion uh -huh. of the house that you're living in. If not, it, it can fall into a state. Uh, it can be forced to fall into a state uh, with rules like gift for the reservation of benefit. That's definitely right. good to know. Thank you. Thanks, Yogesh. What if uh, someone had another property which is rented out at that moment, then can they give that to their son or daughter in their lifetime or like they have to live in? And what happens with the tax for those who so, are in that scenario? Not It doesn't apply for me, but you know it might apply for many people who are listening to this. So this is they're talking referring to an additional property that has been let out that you're yes. trying to give it to your son or daughter. So if it's an additional property, which you, you know, let's say it's, uh, it's been rented out, you never lived in that property. Um, if you do decide to give that to your son or daughter in lifetime, now, it, even though now capital gains, again, there are two taxes that are, that, that are at play, your capital gains tax and your IST. The capital gains tax, be, even though that you're gifting it, there are no uh, cash exchange hands between your, yourself and your son or daughter. It's a connected party transaction. What that means is it will be deemed that you transfer that uh, property over to your son or daughter at market value. So it will crystallize capital gains on, on you. And then for, uh, for IST purposes, it is still considered a pet. And if you die within seven years, yeah, your IST will become the audit as well. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay, uh, I may not make any assumptions. I have heard the word trust associated with IHG. I think you mentioned as well. What is a trust and what are the tax implications of setting up a trust? All right, so trust is technically, there are three people involved when you set up a trust. So let's say that I set up a trust. Let's say that I've got grandkids and I want to set a trust up for my grandkid. And one of the reasons that you would set up a trust is to reduce my estate. Now trust has got three, three, uh, three sectors or three, three sets of people involved. Now, if I have to transfer, let's say that I'm going to transfer 450,000 into a discretionary trust for the benefit of my grandkids for their education. Now, in that at that point, I am the settler of the trust. So I'm transferring 400,000 into a trust. And then I would also appoint trustees to manage the trust deed so that it is the trust is managed uh, in accordance with the deed. So those the trust money is used up for the benefit of the kids, of the grandkids. Now, I could be a trustee or I could have lawyers and accountants appointed as trustees as well. 
and then the beneficiaries are the grandkids it could be you know number of grandkids or it could be even my kids but it's just have to be a little bit careful there if it's going to be your kids they have to be uh, they have to be uh, they can't be minors uh, or if you want to be a trustee of the trust as well they can't be minors they have to be over the age of um, 18 i think uh, and over the age attain age Sure. Uh, in terms of your tax implications there, uh, you need to pay something called lifetime tax. So anything over, so you get to use your 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 355,000 as your annual, uh, your new rate band. Anything over that, you need to pay lifetime tax at 20%. So uh, that's called a CLT, chargeable lifetime transfer. And if you die within seven years after making the transfer, uh, IST can be clawed back on it as well. If I've answered your question, it's, it's easy for you to understand. Thank you. Thanks, Yogesh. People know about trust a bit more for sure now. I was listening to this, and let's uh, face it, in today's modern world, we all have different family dynamics, uh, personal uh, circumstances, uh, divorce, single, uh, married, uh, second marriage, stepchildren, half, half uh, siblings, um, you know, extended families. Everyone has so many different backgrounds um, at this moment, uh, which perhaps not, was not very common, particularly for the South Asians uh, at one time. Sure. So for those people, what do they have to bear in mind given those circumstances, Yogesh? So the starting point is, let's say, you know, you were, you were married before and uh, you were widowed and then you married again. Uh, and then let's say that you, you were widowed again and you were married twice, so then you died. So at that point, your, your nil rate band, your previous, the first husband, if he hasn't used it, that'll be transferred over to you. And your second husband, when he passed, passed away, any nil rate band that he did not use, it will be passed away as well. But what you need to bear in mind is it will be capped at 650,000. So you cannot say if your first husband has a use 325K and if the second husband has a use 325K, uh, it will be capped at the maximum of 325. Okay. Now, when it comes to you know, people are very, you know, you, you could be, you could be married and I have come across clients who, um, you know, at, at their death, they want to make sure that you know, they, they're married and they got, they're married to another wife. You know, they, she, she has got kids from a previous marriage, but he has got assets on his own wife, but he wants to make sure that those assets, they go to his child or his children and to their wives, you know, the wife, previous marriage, the kids of the previous marriage. That's very common. So we tend to set up something called a life interest trust. What that means is that if it's a family home, uh, it could be set it up in a way that he, on, on, on his death, that wife has got, you know, life interest in that property or the assets. And if she remarries or if she, on her death, the life in tr the trust will direct in a way that the assets will pass over to the uh, pass over to the kids of his rather than to uh, the kids of the kids of a previous uh, the wife's previous marriage. That's how it works. A bit complex, but uh, it can be done. It's really interesting because I have friends who have already, uh, I think, to be fair, my parents' generation definitely perhaps didn't think about it and perhaps they were, their lives were so much more simpler. I have friends now who talk about, who are happily married, but they wonder what will happen if something happens to them tomorrow. You know, this is their first marriage. They have one or two children. And, but if something happens to them, they take it for granted their partner, uh, will move on and will get married again and they might decide to have more children or even a, a wife or a husband and then what will happen to their uh, estate is that sure. the same implication then uh, yogesh correct yeah so you can you know, let's say that let's say that let's say that i am married and and then you know on my death i could set up a life interest on in my will 
that there'll be life interest will be set up, life interest trust will be set up, whereby my wife will have life interest in the property, the assets that I own. Uh, the deed will probably will say that you know it'll it, life interest will prevail until she marries or on her death. If she marries somebody else, then the assets will automatically be passed to the kids or on her death, it'll fall into her estate again. Uh, on my death, it'll be exempt because it's uh, the assets will pass to my wife. So there's no IST implications there, but on her death, it will fall into the estate, IST will be paid, and then that will go on to their lineal descendants or their kids. That's how it works. Thank you, Yogesh, because, you know, like uh, people, I have, I, in the past 10 years, I have heard so much about these things <clears throat> um, from very close uh, friends and family. Um, has really definitely made me aware of a lot of things as well, which I wasn't aware. So that's the reason I wanted to ask the question. Thank you. Sure. I have heard a will is a must for inheritance tax. <clears throat> so why is having a will important? <clears throat> and, um, you know, for those in the rare occasion who doesn't know, what is a will? So if you ask me what is a will, the starting point, everyone has to have a will in the UK. Um, if you don't have a will uh, and if you die without a will, it's called you, you die something, it's called you die, uh, you, you, you're interstate. What that means is uh, any assets that you own uh, will be inherited by close family. So if you've got kids, if you don't have a will, it'll go to your kids. Uh, if you don't have kids, it'll go to your brothers and sisters. If you don't have brothers and sisters, uh, it'll go to your, uh, it'll go to your, uh, your mom and dad. If you have none of them, the state will acquire your assets. That's the default position. Okay. Now, as you can see, the will will direct what's going to happen to your assets on your death. Uh, now, everyone, we advise all our clients to have a will. Now, uh, I would also say will has to be reviewed every year, at least every two years. What you also have to remember is if you, you know, if you are married and if you draft a will together or if you're on your own, uh, the will is valid. And then on, if you decide to divorce, the will is still valid. Uh, but if you remarry, the will that you drafted in the previous marriage is annulled. It's not, it's not enforceable in the UK. So especially if you are going to remarry or if you are remarried, you have to visit your will and make sure that it is current after the marriage, so it is enforceable in the UK. I have to ask this question. I know um, it is uh, not a scenario you might consider, but um, there are people who are divorced, widowed, whatever for whatever reason, they, there are people who are in partnerships or living together, but they're not married. So if they do have a will from the previous marriage, they have children, and if they're living together, then what will happen? <clears throat> so if you have a will from the previous marriage, and if you are living together, unless your, your, ex, your, your previous will is still valid, okay, unless you, unless you, expressly go up and make a change to your will, your previous will that you made during the marriage is still valid. That's the default position. So because these together, things are commonplace yeah, these days. So, you know, yeah. it's... Living together does not make, you know, it's not legally recognized in the UK. Only, you know, it's only marriage or civil partnership that, may, that makes the impact on your existing will. There's another thing is when you do the will and there are, you know, templates now to get, have a will done, how would you as an expert recommend people to get the will done? Sure. So I know that you can, I have seen it in, in WH series that you can buy these will packs and you can, I never seen it, my, I've seen the pack, but I never used it myself. Uh, I know that you know you you can you can pretty much write your own will. Now I think they're pretty much you might as well have something similar, something like that than not having a will at all. But generally, with our clients, there are you know there are solicitors that we specialize in drafting wills. We are not allowed to draft wills, but I would refer them to a, a firm of solicitors that I work with, and and they would draft a will which is you know which is pretty much watertight. Whereas with your other wills that you buy off the pack or off the shelf, 
Um, I never seen it myself, but I don't think that that'll be that watertight as as what's been made specifically by a firm of firm of solicitors for you. Thank you. Okay. In the modern life, like as we mentioned, the life has become more complex. So I think it's, I guess it's, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry is the way to. Sure. To, sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. So one of the things uh, people also talk about is uh, executors in a will. So who are the executors and, you know, why is it important for people to know that terminology and what it involves? The, the executors of the will are they are the so your your will will say I could have a will, um, I could say that on my death the I'll have a will um, on my death the direction the will will direct where the assets are going to go, and then I can appoint you, Menaka, for example, as an executor. So mm -hmm. what that means is it's your duty. I would ask you, can I appoint you as an executor? It doesn't have to be you. It can be a firm of lawyers, firm, sorry, a firm of solicitors, a firm of chartered accountants. Uh, it could be a friend, family, daughter. So it's their responsibility to make sure that the, 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 the will is executed, the direction of the assets are executed properly. And it's your responsibility uh, during the administration period as an executor to pay income tax on it because the, the administration period can go up to about, about a year and a half, two years before the actual assets are being passed over to the beneficiaries. So, that, so during that period, there'll be income tax that needs to be paid by the estate. And then, of course, any IST due, it's the executor's duty to, to make sure that uh, they pay the right amount of uh, IST to, to HMI and Customs. And then, of course, after that, the executor's duty is to make sure the assets are distributed accordingly. So that's where the executor comes into play. Thank you so much, Yogesh, because I think I have been, I have been executor. I have had executors because uh, for people who are particularly single, I would definitely suggest if you have young children for, or like if you have grandchildren who your children might be single, please do ask them to write a will and keep a, have an executor because it's, I think it's really, really important. What do you think, Yogesh? Because, you know, particularly if you're single, then, um, you know, that's the reason I wrote my will so much earlier than many other people perhaps would have done because yeah. uh, I wanted to make sure the you know whatever little I had yeah. <laughs> is was maintained well when my daughter grew up. Yeah. Now the main thing is to make sure that your whoever that you're appointing as an executor is a you know a person that you can a person of trust and you are you know it, it they they have to they have to make sure that the, your will is executed um, according to your wishes and the assets are distributed according to the will. So it has to be a person of trust. That's why generally, if you don't have, it's generally a family member. Uh, most of the situations in my in our clients, I've also seen that they appoint a lawyer as firm of, uh, firm of solicitors as well to act as executors of the, of, of the estate. Thank you so much. I think you already covered what happens in the event of death if you do not have written a will, isn't it? Because it's, automatically um, if you have a I, I guess in my case it's very simple I only have one child and it just automatically goes but if you have other more children or more extended family you want to leave to or even a charity you want to leave to then it's more complicated am I right uh, correct what you need to you hit the point you know one of the things that I forgot to mention about uh, I want to mention is if you make any um, if you make any let's say that you want to give 250,000 to a charity during lifetime now uh, that is an exempt transfer in the UK, so that will never be considered a pet. It is completely exempt. It will not eat it to your nil rate ban. Uh, that's there's also something called uh, you can also make something called you know, if you give ten percent of your estate to a charity on death, it should make up. It's quite complex. I should make ten percent of the baseline amount. Your ISG rate will fall from forty to thirty six percent. Now I've seen. You know, you will save a lot of IST in your situation. You know, you will make twenty thousand worth of uh, a, a gift to the charity through the estate, but the IST that you would save on it could be about sixty k. So it is worthwhile considering that. Um, 
sorry, I just lost your question there, Manika. So you asked me. Yes, I, I think it, it is a, a more complex if you want to leave it to a charity or even to a, you know, you might, you might want to leave it to an old school or another institute or something like that. So, you know, like, is it, how, yeah. why is it so important to write the will? That's what I was driving Absolutely, at. yeah. So what you do, the will has to be there. And, and if you want to make, you know, you can even direct in your will that 10% of your, uh, your estate has, has to go into these charities, which are named. Uh, and then, of course, you know, if you qualify for the base, if you if you qualify for the ten percent rate, you know, qualify for the ten percent of the baseline amount, your IST rate will drop from forty to thirty six percent. Correct. But will is a must. If you don't have a will, if you die without a will, it you're considered interstate. Uh, then, like I mentioned before, uh, it'll be your kids, if not your brothers and sisters, if not your parents, uh, if nobody, then it's your state that will acquire your assets. Thank you. This is, I think it's very important. On that question, can I also ask, I think I mentioned, like, can they leave it to the a school or another institution? Like, uh, it might not be a charity. Do they still get the exemption or not really? So it has to be a registered charity in the UK or EU. Now, I don't think schools qualify as a charity. So I don't think you would get that right now. Sure. Thank you even more pleasant subject. I have heard the word lasting power of attorney. What is it and how would it help someone? So lasting powers of attorney is, you know, it is something given to, uh, so I could give you, Manaka, a lasting power of attorney so that if I, you know, if I come into a position where I can't mentally, I'm not capable of making decisions, uh, you will be acting on my behalf to make those decisions. Now, the last two powers of attorney, uh, it's a legal area. Uh, it's generally done by solicitors. But you, what I can say is you need to acquire that last, or you, if you want to give that last two power of attorney to somebody else, it has to be done when you have mental capacity. Once the mental capacity is gone, uh, you can't, so let's say that I'm mentally cap incapable of managing myself. Um, you, I can't give that last two power of attorney at that point. The courts will step in. The courts will decide you know, what needs to be done, or in some cases, courts will say, uh, Menaka, you're the right person to have lasting power of attorney. So it, it's, it's a legalistic area, but that is something that everyone should, you know, uh, should, should consider when they are, you know, when, when, they're, when they're terminally ill or they're progressively getting ill, so that someone can manage the affairs when they are not mentally capable of, capable of making those decisions. Thanks, Yogesh. When you do have a lasting power of fraternity, this has happened to me not about lasting power of fraternity, about executors. Uh, one of my very close friends put me as an executor and I never knew it. And you know, now the kid is grown up uh, about 18, so that doesn't apply anymore. Um, and I didn't know about this for a long time. But do you think it's important to let the other person know if you are putting them as a power of fraternity or as an executor? Absolutely. So um... You don't appoint, you don't take, especially appointing an executor, you don't take it lightly, in your, you know, you don't take it lightly, you know, it is that other person should know that you've been appointed as an executor in the will, and it has to, you know, you, you have, you know, you, have, you, you ought to gain their, gain their approval uh, that they've been appointed, and they should be a person of trust, so that is very important. Uh, last in part of attorney, again, you know, you don't appoint someone without telling someone that, you know, you, this person, you know, I can't just appoint you and not letting you know that, you know, you got the last in part of attorney. Uh, you ought to know it's, it's best that I talk to you about it. And then you know that, you know, when, when I'm not mentally capable of making those decisions, that you have got the power to act on my behalf. So it's very important that the person should know. Why do you think it's important to know? And because it, you know, I had personal experiences, it was really a surprise for me. Or oh, you know, I was the executor of the will. But uh, why do you think it's really important to let the other person know, Yogesh? So, in terms of the lasting power of attorney, or in terms both. of both, for both the executor, you they be caught by surprise. You know, you don't want someone to be, you know, you you you're at your death, and and uh, and you know, you got this will you know, with a firm of lawyers who, who got it locked up and they, you know, you at your death, firm of lawyers, solicitors calling you and say, by the way, did you know that you are the executor of the will? And you'd be going, what do you mean? So it's always, 
it's best to know, you know, it's best that the other person knows that that you are the executor on my on my path, so that you you know you're prepared and you can step in and you know what your responsibilities are. Same goes for asking power of attorney as well. You know, it, it, it's again the person has to be of trust, and they ought to know that you're you're allowed to make those decisions. Again, you know, you don't want a firm of solicitors calling you up and saying, "Did you know by the way you're, you know you got the last in power of attorney?" It's it's better then for them to know that so they can plan ahead as well and they are ready. Thank you, Gesh. You have covered quite a bit. At least I have definitely <laughs> taken a few points away to uh, think about. Would you be able to share two or three things people must remember? Uh, you know, like when they talk, think about your guest presentation about inheritance tax, what do they have to kind of share with their friends and family and think about for sure? Um, what I would like to say is don't, don't bury your sand, you know, bury your head in the sand and think this is not going to affect me, uh, especially you know, if you're in the UK and if you're a domicile, if you're a resident, uh, not only your UK assets, your worldwide assets will fall into their state as well. So you might have property uh, worldwide. You, know, you can have property in India, in Sri Lanka. So that falls into their state as well. Although as much, you know, you would get a tax credit if you do end up paying IST in those countries. Now, the second, you know, especially, secondly, I would say if you are living in there in London, if you own a property, this 325 bracket and 175k bracket can easily be breached. So you just have to be aware of it, that it is lurking behind you, and you've got to start thinking about it and start taking advice and plan for it. And, and third, third, I would say everyone has to have a will. Don't die interstate. You know, it's very complex when you die interstate. You've got to have a will so that your assets are directed that's got direction of the where the assets are going. So those are the key things to take, take away from here. Thank you so much, Yogi. So we have all learned a lot about inheritance tax. Thank you so much. And okay. uh, for people who are listening, you have the rest of the day to think about. And I would uh, suggest to you, everyone gets into action on Monday morning, thinking what are you going to do about your wills, about inheritance tax, mm -hmm. because that's the point of doing this early in the year so that you, <clears> by, <throat> um, you know, by end of January, you have everything in place, uh, what is needed. So thank you so much, Yogesh. Thank you for, for that, giving me uh, the opportunity and I hope it was helpful for your audience, Manika. I'm sure it is. What I didn't mention is I know you guys now almost 14, 15 years now. Yes, he's my friend as well. So I don't mind him leaving the will uh, for me. Uh, I would take it with both hands. Thank you so much, Yogesh. Following tradition, <laughs> let yeah. me announce the next topic for the next week. On the 23rd of January, we will be talking about nurturing your eyes with Dr. Ravindra Kartik. He's a medical director of Netralia Bangalore, managing director from AIMS, and we are fellow from Sankara Netralia, Cornea fellow from University of Rochester in America. Definitely a bit more upbeat topic of nurturing our eyesight for the next time. For now, over to Kirbe Kohut to give the word of thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that was an overload of information, uh, Yogesh, and, and really an eye-opener. But before I say more, I would just like to thank the uh, Facebook uh, viewers. Thank you very much for your support and uh, for your ardent um, following on uh, Meet Menaga celebrating you. We would like to always have you on our, our Facebook and thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, last and not least for our faithful followers of uh, those who come every week and support Meet Menaga celebrating you on this Zoom um, connection, we want to personally thank you. And for Yogesh, Yes, I've come to your, I have come to know Yogesh through um, the host Menaga. And uh, a little that I know about him is he's a very detail-oriented person, meticulous, 
I think it comes with the territory being um, an accountant, a deep thinker. You know, we, we spent Christmas Eve together and uh, lots of very in-depth talks and a very, very deep thinker, strong sense of integrity. And he has a solid work ethics. And this is what I, I love about Yogesh. And Yogesh, thank you so much for gracing this occasion. And for those, once again, I just want to encourage you to, to revisit the recording on the YouTube because there's a lot of information that you may be wanting to refresh. And if you want a personal, um, what shall I say? A, a personal uh, talk with uh, Yogesh, contact me. I know him personally. <laughs> Yogesh, thank you. And You're thank most welcome. Thank you. <laughs> there is a glowing uh, credit, Yogesh, from Kirubai. <laughs> thank you. Most welcome. Thank you so much, Sandeep. Thank you so much, Yogesh. Really appreciate your contribution for the talk show. And we all learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. For people who are listening to us on Facebook, Thank you so much, as always, for your support and contribution. And uh, hopefully you also learned a lot about it. And it will be on YouTube later, as usual. Please support us to grow and share this information for a wider audience by subscribing on the YouTube. It has come to that time of the day to say goodbye. Until we see you next week, same place, same time, to talk about nurturing the eyesight and nurturing our eyes more importantly. Stay safe, be happy and keep smiling.